I have the honor to introduce the next speaker, the 12th U.S. Secretary of Energy, Dr. Stephen Chu. But before I do that, let me share a secret. Every sentence, every action in this summit is highly scripted by RPE days and weeks in advance and practiced over and over again. So I thought I would share with you perhaps the most unscripted moment of all the summits. It was about two years ago when the then governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, was in the middle of a very passionate and thoughtful speech about energy and climate. The secretary and I were sitting right in front, and we were mesmerized by the oration of our famous governor. When suddenly, out of the blue, he looked at Secretary Chu and asked, Stephen, how are your glutes doing? You need to work on your glutes. Now, Mr. Secretary, don't get me wrong. You are a famous guy. You have accomplished so much in so little time. You have won Nobel Prize, and you may well get another one. You're a hero to all of us. But of all the talents that you are known for, and for all you have to offer to America, the governor focused on your glutes? Am I missing something here? I think we need an investigation. Or if you prefer, a congressional hearing on this topic. This is one you might actually enjoy. The RPE summit will perhaps be one of his last, if not the last public event that he appears in as the Secretary of Energy. So let me remind everyone about a few facts. Secretary Chu was a member of the Gathering Storm Committee that proposed RPE's creation. He represented the committee in congressional hearings, which led to RPE's authorization in the Competes Act. And then as Secretary of Energy, he launched RPE in 2009 with $400 million from the Recovery Act. I would not have joined as the director of RPE if it was not for him. And we certainly would not have had these summits without his support and engagement. There are many fathers and mothers and babysitters of RPE, but it's fair to say that RPE would not exist without the vision, the stewardship, and deep support of Secretary Chu. If you look back over the last four years, a multitude of things have happened, which are well recorded in his public letter, but let me step back and give my own perspective. We are living in an age where in every act of our lives, we benefit from 250 years of industrial revolution, which is all about energy technologies. We as a world are now in some element of crisis, both fiscal and climate. We need a new industrial revolution, one that is sustainable in all aspects of its meaning. History has taught us that these moments of crisis must not be wasted because they offer opportunities to shape the future in ways that could not have been done without the crisis. But it needs leaders to step up and be bold and audacious in their thinking and actions and have the determination and the glutes to follow through. When all is said and done, 10 to 20 years from now, we will all look back and say that in this moment of crisis, it was Secretary Chu who stepped up and led us from the front to create institutions like RPE, the Energy Innovation Hubs, and the Energy Frontier Research Centers as a bold package to accelerate progress in science and engineering to create that new industrial revolution for a sustainable energy future, not just for the United States, but for the world. And for that, the world owes you a huge debt of gratitude for your integrity, 
for your commitment and personal sacrifice to make a better world for all our children. Please welcome to the stage the 12th U.S. Secretary of Energy, Dr. Stephen Chu. So I was told to push function F5, but that is not the right thing. It, they really meant this one, and we'll see if it works. Function F5 uh, turns on and off the wireless people. So does it work? Good. Well, first, um, thank you, Arun, for that very generous introduction. But I have to protest, my glutes aren't that bad. <laughs> um, uh, they've fallen down a little bit <laughs> in the last four years, but uh, because I can only ride my bicycle on weekends, but I'll work on it. So uh, I want to give you a little bit of what I see as a vision of the future and what has happened in the past. But before I do that, I want to talk about, uh, you know, whenever you give visions of the future, uh, you have to remember what the great American philosopher of the 20th century said. Uh, of that, of course, was uh, Yogi Berra. On the right, uh, you see him having a philosophical conversation with an umpire. But he said many wise things. One of the things he says is difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Now, every time I use this quote, scores of people email me or come up afterwards and say, Yogi Berra didn't really say that. So-and-so said that. All right, here's a list of all the people that have said it. Niels Bohr, Casey Stengel, Mark Twain, George Bernard Shaw, Victor Borgo, Woody Allen, Groucho Marx, Confucius, even Dan Quayle has been attributed to saying that. So we don't really know who said it. But let me talk about some of the futurist predictions that turned out not to be true or some of them that turned out to be true. Very famous prediction, Louis Strauss, uh, who is then a commissioner of the Atomic Energy Commission, said, our children will enjoy in their homes, electrical energy too cheap to meter. And of course, you thought he was talking about fission nu nuclear energy, um, but he wasn't. He was actually thinking of a secret project going on in the government that was fusion nuclear energy. So anyway, uh, the Wright brothers made a first uh, powered flight in 1903. One of the most famous physicists of its time, Lord Kelvin, said, an airplane will never be practically successful in 1902. In 1901, Wilbur Wright told his brother, and quote, I said to my brother Orville that a man would not fly for 50 years. This demonstration of my impotence as a prophet gave me such a shock that ever since I've dis distrusted myself and avoided all predictions. Very wise. But, you know, success is never assured, even when you do succeed. Um, look at um, the tale of Alexander Graham Bell. He invented the telephone, succeeded in getting the patent, and afterward, two years after he got the patent for the phone, uh, Sir William Peace, which, who was the uh, chief engineer of the British Post Office, said, Americans have need for the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. So uh, this is a common theme. Uh, people who are invested in existing technologies are sometimes not able to recognize or reluctant to recognize uh, when a transformation, transformative innovation occurs. Um, and you know, inventors and innovators uh, sometimes are in love with their own technologies. That's the flip side of the inertia of recognizing a new technology, especially if you're not chart leading the way. And so this reminds me, oh, I have to say something else about Arun. My talk is not scripted. In fact, I just finished it three minutes ago. <laughs> Those of you who know me know what I talk about. Um, and uh, so let me tell you about a story about inventors uh, uh, and innovators. Um, it's an apocryphal story. It's uh, uh, a man and his bride are in the car. They just got married. They're going uh, off to their honeymoon. And the bride says, you have to be gentle with me, dear. I'm a virgin. And he says, how can you be a virgin? You've been married twice before. She says, well, as you know, the first, my first husband married was a very elderly gentleman. 
I, we married when I was 20. He was a father for me. It was a platonic relationship. And the second husband turned out, we found out he was gay, and so the marriage split up. And then the husband says, I know husband number three. He was not gay. He was not old. What's the deal here? And she said, ah, yes, he was an entrepreneur. <laughs> Every night he would sit at the foot of my bed and tell me how good it was going to be. <laughs> okay. My public affairs are now crawling <laughs> under their seats. <laughs> <clears throat> Let me tell you about another success story, but it wasn't as smooth a success story as you may be told in history books. Uh, in 1899, Henry Ford founded the Detroit Automobile Company, but it, that company wasn't making the quality cars that he demanded, and so in 1901, he just disbanded the company. It, he, then he started something called the he Henry Ford Motor Company. He got a bunch of investors, but he was the chief engineer. He was not the CEO. Then they hired a consultant engineer uh, in 1902, a year later. He got highly insulted and quit. Said, I'm out of here. And uh, the company named Henry Ford Motor Company, lucky for him, changed the name and, and renamed it the Cadillac Automotive Company. So then Henry Ford goes around and gets some other investors and finds the Ford Motor Company. But, you know, Henry Ford's lawyer was asked, uh, he asked the president of the bank of uh, Michigan Savings Bank, should he invest in this company? And he says, the horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty, a fad. So his lawyer, Rackham, said, oh, I'll invest $5,000, what the heck? And he cashed in later for $12.5 million. Now, 1917, 127 U.S. auto companies manufacturing cars. 1926, 43 companies. 1947, 12 companies. We're down to three U.S. companies. Does that mean the automobile's a failure? I don't think so. What happens is there were transfer innovations all the way, and uh, many of the other companies uh, that were failed, quote, failed, they weren't failed, they were merged, they were bought up, all of these other things. So this is part of technology development, and we should remember that. Now, the transformation from the automobile, from the horse to the automobile was very, very rapid. I show you pictures of New York in the 1890s. I show you a picture of Detroit circa 1920. We're talking about 25 years where you want from mostly horse-drawn to mostly gasoline-powered automobiles. The technology turned out to be superior, but there was another serious environmental pollution issue that hastened the transition. What was that issue? 160,000 horses in New York and Brooklyn in 1880, producing three to four million pounds of horse manure and 40,000 gallons of urine a day. The horse manure is piling up in all the vacant lots, one story high. The fertilizer market was long since saturated, and uh, it became a pollution issue. Now, today we s suffer from another pollution issue, but it uh, has less odor. And that is uh, the fact that the climate's changing. Uh, most scientists who've really studied this believe a significant part of that, an overwhelming part of that, is due to greenhouse gases. This is a picture, a graph of the temperature, the average temperature of the world from 1800 to 2010. And let me just focus on the last 30 years, from 1880 to 2011. What has happened? Well, I'm not going to go into all the things that happened in terms of what we've seen, things of that nature. I'm going to take a very green eye change approach to this and only tell you two things, one thing. This is a graph produced by Munich Re, a reinsurance company. And in this, it, it looks at geological events like earthquakes, that's the I don't know what color it is, purple. What happened to my graph? Hello, guys. Ah, I'd rather you see graphs on that side instead of me, but never mind. Uh, geological events, earthquakes, uh, meteorological events. <laughs> Thank you. 
meteorological events, storms, hydrological events like floods, and what they call climatological events like extreme temperature, drought, forest fires. But the climate modelers uh, feel that uh, many of these hydro hydrological events and uh, storms and floods are also related to climate change. You notice it's increasing, but it's also increasing with an upward curvature. Well, it's a reinsurance company, so they're interested in insurance losses, both insured and non-insured. Most of the losses are uninsured. Most of the losses, the overwhelming majority of losses, are in the United States because the United States is a wealthy country and uh, builds a lot on rivers and on seacoasts. And the trend line is now $170 billion a year in losses, starting from below 50 billion a year, of which the majority is in the U.S. So just in a green eye shades approach to this, it's beginning if there is a correlation between violent storms and hydrological events and all this other stuff, the earthquakes were relatively flat. Um, uh, they're costing real money. Okay. So right now, in 2012, we spent uh, $430 billion on importing foreign oil. And although our imports have fallen to a 25-year low, we still have a huge dependency on oil and uh, foreign oil. And so you can ask the question, you know, there have been predictions, uh, Hubbard-like predictions, that perhaps the production of oil will peak and decline or peak and flatten uh, due to dwindling resources, things of that nature. And maybe that, because of that, it will naturally price itself higher, therefore renewables becomes better. Well, I don't think so. Um, these are the oil and gas reserves that, oh, from 1981 to 2011. They've kept pace with growing demand and this does not include the shale gas and shale oil uh, reserves. So they have not yet been included. So uh, I'm going to quote one of my favorite authors. Our ability to find and extract fossil fuels continues to improve, and economically recoverable reservoirs around the world are likely to keep pace with the rising demand for decades. Uh, that was Arun Majumdar and I, one of my favorite authors. And we go on in that article to say this, you know, there's a well-known saying, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. Uh, and then we've added, Arun and I added, we've actually transitioned to better solutions. So what is the goal of RPE and much of the rest of the Department of Energy? It's to enhance innovation so that sustainable energy solutions are the better solution, the cheaper solution, the more economical solution. All right? And that's an achievable goal. Now, let me give you just two examples. A program, not uh, Sunshine, it's connected to RPE, but it's this so called Sunshine program where the goal was to reduce the cost, the total cost of uh, PV from what it is today, uh, utility scale, it's about 14 cents a kilowatt hour in sunny places like California, to 5 to 6 cents a kilowatt hour. Some say it's 12 cents. The blue on those graphs, it it's, has to do with residential, commercial rooftop, utility scale, uh, and utility scale ground mount and to the scale, you know, moving around mounts. The blue is a balance of system beyond the solar panels or collectors and beyond the inverters. It's cost of land, cost of construction, cost of licensing, cost of all those other things. Those are so-called so soft costs. And what Min Lee, the uh, director of Sunshine, said about soft costs, they're mostly bureaucratic costs. Unlike physics, where we can fundamentally figure out the upper limit for efficiency of solar cells, there's no such limit to bureaucracy. <laughs> so what we are doing is something different in the Department of Energy in the last couple of years. We recognize that the bureaucracy is going to be the dominant cost. It already is on rooftops. Uh, costs $2.50 a watt to install in Germany, costs five fifty dollars in the U.S. It ain't the cost of the labor. It's the cost of all the hassle and bureaucracy. And so we're working very hard to do that. We have another grand challenge, EV everywhere. Again, it's how do you make 
better solutions, more economical energy efficient solutions, competitive without any subsidy. And that goal would be um, something like a twenty to twenty-five thousand dollar car, which EV or plug-in hybrid, which is competitive with a forty mile a gallon car uh, of the same performance and size. So that's our goal. It's an audacious goal, but it's a goal we think it'll work. Now, some people, when we first started the Sunshine Goal, said you must be smoking something. A year or two later, the people in the industry said, you know, you forced us to go back and look at our business model. You talked to us to develop new business models, and now we think that goal is realizable. I quote Michelangelo, the great, greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. This is what RP is about. All right. Now, I want to talk briefly in my closing moments about the culture of RPE. And this culture and spirit is now being disseminated to other parts of the Department of Energy. Sunshine is a good example. The uh, first, if you will, leader of that Sunshine program, Ramesh, was recruited by Arun and I, another friend of ours from Berkeley. Why don't you come to DC and serve? Um, as and uh, he and a few other people like Min Lee, Rachel Thornstein, others, uh, that small cadre of individuals literally transformed this part of the agency. The budget did not go up. Uh, the career people were still there. But they got excited and they believed in what they were doing. And um, unsolicited uh, feedback, uh, they would tell me, uh, these are academics, friends of mine in universities, these are friends of mine out there in the venture capital world, they said it's a dramatic increase in the quality of the program. You're now funding the best stuff. Okay, EERE, uh, a founder, Dave Danielson, in the founding member of uh, RPE, he is now Assistant Secretary of EERE. He's bringing that culture to all of uh, EERE, which is energy efficiency and renewable energy, of which the Sunshine Program is a part of it. So this is what is really happening. What was that culture? Well, it was uh, designed with some malice of forethought. Uh, as many of you or all of you know, I spent nine years at Bell Laboratories. Uh, in Bell Laboratories over its 75-year history, 17 people who worked at Bell Labs went on to get Nobel Prizes. This is even more remarkable because virtually all, all the people that got Nobel Prizes were young scientists. They were hired as young people. They were not hired the way, you know, richer universities can hire older 65-year-old Nobel laureates. <laughs> Actually, they hired me when I was young, too. <laughs> uh, but they were hired fresh out of PhDs or fresh out of postdoc. Okay, I was a, I was a postdoc. I was made an assistant professor at Berkeley, but I, the first year I was allowed to take a leave of absence and I went to Bell Labs. Uh, all right, another quote from my favorite author, me. The cramped labs and office cubicles force us to interact with each other and, allow each other's pro and follow each other's progress. The animated discussions were common during and after seminars and at lunch and continued on the tennis court and at parties. That spirit was really replicated in RPE. They have an RPE happy hour. They would go into five, six, or seven, and every Friday night they would retire uh, to a bar and continue their discussions on science. Um, now, these animated discussions were sometimes pretty frank, and as Ramesh said, he would call them constructive confrontation. So some of the questions were blunt. There was one famous uh, department head at Bell Labs whose his favorite question is, what the hell you want to do that for? <laughs> But more politely, some people will say, you know, I think you're wrong because of X, Y, and Z. And then you would have to discuss this in front of everybody else. And the point here is rank didn't matter. Rank in, within Bell Labs didn't matter. You could be a postdoc, you could be a department head, you could be a member of staff, you could be an executive uh, director of Bell Laboratories. It was just your quality of ideas. And everything was open to scrutiny. And it, discussion was encouraged. It became the course of the day. You don't sit there and politely hear people out and just go away and muttering under your breath. You actually bring it up, throw it on the table. That was, that was what 
was started in RPE. That's what was started in Sunshot, and this is what Dave Danielson is trying to do. Just in a three-year period, these are three of the characters that were hired fresh out of graduate school or a postdoc. Okay, just to give you a glimpse of the three, of, that's me at 32. Those other pictures were taken later. They did not look like that when they were hired. Um, but anyway, now, um, um, sometimes in a position as, as Secretary of Energy, you can get viciously attacked. Uh, this happens to me weekly, daily sometimes. And <laughs> so this was, um, this was a headline in The Onion, February 7th. Hungover Energy Secretary wakes up next to solar panel. I'll read you parts of this scurrilous report. Sources have reported that following a long night of carousing and a series of DC watering holes, Energy Secretary Stephen Chu awoke Thursday morning to find himself sleeping next to a giant solar panel he had met the previous evening. And they reported that he could not remember the manufacturer's name. <laughs> According to sources, Chu's encounter with the crystalline solar receptor was his most regrettable dalliance since 2009, <laughs> when an extended fling with a 90-foot wind turbine nearly ended his marriage. <laughs> All right. So you got to say something. You got to respond. You got to respond quickly, or it can get out of hand. So, uh, so that we immediately that day issued the following statement. I just want everyone to know that my decision not to serve the second term as Secretary of Energy has absolutely nothing to do with allegations made in this week's edition of The Onion. While I'm not going to confirm or deny the charges specifically, I will say that clean renewable solar power is a growing source of U.S. jobs and becoming more and more affordable. So it's no surprise that lots of Americans are falling in love with solar. <laughs> now, my public affairs refuse to let me add, regardless of sexual orientation. <laughs> Um, now, after four years and a little bit and some change, friends would sometimes ask me, you know, knowing what you know today, would you have agreed to be Secretary of Energy? They fell for me when I was up there and countless oversight things and other things like that. And the answer is absolutely yes. Because um, it's something that really, you go to do a job, you go to do what you can, and uh, it's very important. But in hindsight, it's not the starting of issues and things like that that Rune talked about. It was actually hiring the, the right people. Um, you know, I got on the phone and tried to recruit people all the way down to the program manager level, which is somewhat unusual for a secretary. That's about seven levels or eight levels down. Uh, and, um, and after you get the right people, you give them the resources, but mostly you do blocking and tackling, to use a football analogy so that they can run with the ball. And let me give you one example. When Arun was hired and he wanted to go and talk to Congress and, uh, and the uh, Congressional Affairs part of the Department of Energy told him, no, you can't do that because you know, we, we don't know what he's going to say, what he'll do. And I said, no, he gets to talk to whoever he wants to on the Hill, so leave him alone. But had I not done that, they would have said, no, you can't do that. He turned out to be one of the best ambassadors for the Department of Energy in our history. So to quote the uh, saying from the big Lebowski, the chew ab abides. <laughs> uh, let me tell you about this. This is uh, one of my favorite shots taken December 24th, 1968. The first mission to orbit the moon. You see this beautiful... Earth uh, rising above a bleak lunar landscape. Um, look around. Uh, there's really nowhere else to go. So we really have to take care of our environment. Um, the astronaut who took the picture said, we came all this way to explore the moon. And the most important thing is we discovered the Earth. Since that time, we're more, I shouldn't use the word confident, but we believe with much more confidence that we're altering the destiny of the Earth. But it's not a false choice. Either you decrease carbon emissions 
and spend a lot of money or you just go in the same direction you're going. That is a false choice. I want to reiterate that what RP is about, what the Department of Energy is about, what you are all about is that it will be the better choice. It was the transition from the Stone Age because there was a better set of technologies. And for that, uh, you want to remember. So, I, I wrote a message to my employees that became public and I just want to remind you, we do have a moral responsibility to the most innocent victims should adverse climate change occur. Those are the poorest citizens of the world and those yet to be born. There's an ancient American, Native American saying that says, we do not inherit the land from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. And a few short decades later, what we don't want to have happen is for our children to ask themselves of us, what were our parents thinking? Didn't they care about us? Thank you. Applause. That's part of the game. Come on. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was told I should stay there. Well, the applause ended. Thank you. Uh, 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 some of the party and cabinet members have a lunch uh, at the White House with the president, so I've got to go. Thank you. <laughs> Love you all, but I gotta go.